Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. Sheffield Hallam University, part of the campus, with uh, Keith Davids. Keith, welcome to the Talent Equation. Great, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Stuart. Uh, welcome to my second office at uh, Sheffield <laughs> Hallam University. And it's good to um, also see Ben Galloway, who's here visiting from Brisbane. I've enjoyed Ben's uh, video clips online and YouTube for, for a few years now. Yep. Yeah, um, I just picked up Ben from the station. He's over here to go to the Future of Coaching Conference with me, um, having been three months in Uganda. Yep, yep, three months in Uganda, for sure. <laughs> and going back. Going back. Yeah. There you go. Can't get enough. Yep, love it too much. So welcome along as well. Um, so Keith, starting point, I suppose. Um, uh, I guess it's a long story of how you've kind of come to be one of the let, let's call it um, at the risk of embarrassing you one of the founding fathers of kind of the kind of ecological approach in sport grandfathers <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean just talk me through that journey of kind of how you ended up sort of researching in this space really well yeah I mean after hopefully I can re- remember back you know but it, I think it all started when I was an undergrad student at St Mary's College as it was then at um, Strawberry Hill Twickenham and in those days you could only train as a PE teacher and uh, I picked up a book on something called motor learning, <laughs> motor behaviour, uh, one was by Bob Singer, a fantastic book, another one by, um, uh, I think it was, no, it was Singer actually in those days, yeah, um, and uh, yeah, it just set me on the pathway, um, I really enjoyed reading about it um, and I, I thought it actually, I could I could draw the links with my practical applications that I wanted to make in those days as a as a football coach. Uh, ben, you know, uh, not very good football coach, but still, I, I just thought, oh, great, I can you know, think about this, think about that, uh, and then yeah, stuck with it ever since. And so it's interesting how St Mary's is a bit of a bit of a hotbed, I think, isn't it, from of people who've kind of operated in this motor learning ecological space because I think uh, previous podcast guest um, Amy Price uh, yes. studied under Len Arnold who's there as well uh, oh okay yeah, yeah. I mean uh, I've, I've read some of Amy's work um, but before that um, if I take you back again yeah. into the distant past um, Dave Sutton okay. was there and Dave Sutton uh, was Pro Vice Chancellor at Leeds University uh, and a big name in motor development for years um, and actually the link goes on because um, I went on to do a PhD uh, under Dave Sugden's supervision when he was just a professor at um, uh, Leeds University um, uh, and that was in the late 1970s and that's where I first started to discover ecological psychology mm-hmm. so the themes are still there so maybe you can trace some of it back to uh, uh, St Mary's I don't know and now, um, obviously, the, the journey's been all over the world, but now, obviously, been at Sheffield for how long now? Um, since 2014. Right. Yeah, um, so um, uh, technically 2013, but uh, we, we actually moved over um, back to the UK, back to Sheffield in um, 2014, so I've been here for five years. Yeah, very and when you say moved over, from where? Um, from Brisbane. Right. Yeah, Brisbane there. Uh, uh, where I was working at QT at the time, and uh, we decided the next phase part time, let's um, go back to um, UK, and particularly Sheffield, where all the kids were born. 
uh, left two of them in Brisbane still, so uh, yeah, it gives us a you know an opportunity to go back and visit people there. Of course, you know friends and family and things like that. So um, there you go, QUT, where you are, Ben, <laughs> a hotbed of <laughs> hotbed of ecological research. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so um, I guess the oh, I don't know starting point. I've got so many thoughts, questions, ideas, but um, I mean a lot of the stuff that we've talked about I talk about within this podcast and I've deliberately tried to sort of keep it focused on ecological approach uh, non-linear pedagogy constraints led approach largely because it felt to me like there wasn't really anything um, out there in the podcast land there's obviously very good stuff on YouTube um, uh, uh, but there's nothing out there in the podcast land that was really talking about these ideas and concepts and so we've just stayed in that space and trying to basically try and blend between the academic world and the yeah. theoretical side of things yeah. and also but but practitioners who are out there yeah. living and breathing it and their experiences and just getting them to share some of those experiences yeah. and people seem to be sort of quite well resonating with that and, and, yeah. and interested in it yeah. I mean from your perspective in terms of your life's work so to speak yeah, yeah. it must be must feel quite an interesting journey yeah. in terms of and I don't know what your reflections are from when you were talking about this, say, 20, 30 years ago, yeah. and what must have been really niche, okay. to now what feels to me like a growing movement. Ben and I were just reflecting on this in the car. Okay. It feels like, it's yeah. nowhere near mainstream yet, no. but it feels to me like there's a growth and a real interest. I don't know if you're getting anything similar. Yeah, I, I think I can pick that up. Uh, I mean, I, th- I think, uh, you know, you downplay your influence, Stuart, because I've uh, heard a lot of people uh, mention, you know, the quality of your podcast and others that are emerging. Obviously quality from a discussion point of view in terms of the guests, nothing to do with sound quality, because <laughs> that's still an ongoing learning journey. <laughs> well, yeah, content certainly is, uh, is what I'm talking about there, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I think that uh, the, the new digital media, uh, access to these ideas uh, online, um, using video images, sound, etc., uh, video clips on YouTube, explaining quite complex um, uh, concepts in simple terms and very applied as you say. I think inhabiting that space between scientific knowledge um, and practical application that's what I'm detecting. I think that's where the big growth is now. Mm -hmm. Uh, When I say big growth uh, it's all relative. Mm -hmm. Of course you know it's not uh, it's not nowhere near absolutely mainstream of course Um, uh, but it's certainly growing and it's really heartening that a lot of practitioners, people involved in sports, um, from a maybe a practitioner viewpoint, coaching, uh, sports science support, uh, coach education, and um, uh, sports organisation, etc. A lot of those people are getting involved in the scientific ideas. So a big challenge, I think, is to explain these quite complex conceptual terms in ways that people can use them. Mm. Use, utilize the ideas and make sense of them rather than just that they exist in a sort of philosophical sphere which is all well and good for academics to discuss, have debates and discussions at meetings but really it's about understanding how can we uh, apply these ideas, how can we transform lives I, I, I want to make that point because um, the Sheffield Hallam University strategic plan for um, 2018 mentions this which really if you like struck me really like that idea of transforming lives by improving the quality of practice, the improving the quality of the experiences that people face um, under all sorts of different conditions, whether they've got the best facilities, the best opportunities going, or as I've been talking to Ben about, his experiences in Uganda where he's been working um, in conditions which are quite frankly really challenging, <laughs> etc. You know, so maybe we should talk to Ben about transforming lives. Yeah, and it's interesting how um, I think that's an interesting area that a lot of universities are working in now, isn't it? Is recognising the need for application of the theoretical ideas, yeah. uh, not least of which because of an employability yes. aspect. You know, yes. students want to leave here with real world skills that yes. they can apply in uh, in a, in a in a, in, a, in a working context yeah, yeah. from my perspective um, I mean it's one thing I suppose being like a, I feel like a bit, a bit like a translator so you take like a theoretical concept mm. like affordances for example mm. which is the one that seems to keep coming back and round and 
and then try and translate it, make it real for somebody, make it applicable, make them be able to um, work with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I suppose that's part of the role. But I feel like um, I was had a debate interestingly with um, uh, a guy on Twitter today um, mm-hmm. who described. Um, non, non-linear pedagogy and skill acquisition mm. the, the book he wrote with uh, Jia Chow yeah. and uh, Ian Renshaw and Chris Button am mm-hmm. I right? Yeah, yeah. and they described it as a, a what do they say it was? they said it was well basically they were describing it as being pretty hard to read Okay, yeah, yeah. and I said to them I responded and said well it's like anything isn't it? Um, you've got to invest in it mm. so I said it's like mining for gold mm. right? you've got to put the work in mm. and then you get the nuggets yeah, yeah. Right, but if you don't put the work in, then actually, where's the value in itself? Yes, yes. Um, but even that, but but I, I found that book to be far more accessible than a lot of the other stuff yes. that's out there, which yeah, I yeah. find really. And I imagine your intent was to write it in that accessible way. Yeah, in quite an accessible way. I mean, I think uh, we were still at the stage. This is 2016, and so it was uh, the book. When you write a book, it's about two years lead time right. to publication. So. In, in the two years before that, really, it was also about making sure that people um, understand the conceptual mm. basis mm. as well. You see, I sympathise with someone who says, I wish it was easy, uh, more accessible and easier, I haven't got that conceptual background, etc. Yeah. Um, but, but that's the point. That's the point, is that having that conceptual background will give you a richer interpretation of the book. Yeah. Um, we really want to avoid writing a book that's full of fair, you know, maybe sound bites or practical ways of explaining things that are very simplistic, yeah. that don't give you a little bit of the depth of the theoretical, um, the conceptual rationale, because with that, that gives you the roots, if you like, so that you can make decisions about um, why you are adopting a certain coaching practice or sports science practice, rather than another type of approach rather than just a sort of superficial understanding of a very thin layer mm. um, that can, you know, they can take you so far, but really it's about digging a little bit deeper so that you have got that rationale and wherewithal to then go deeper if you want to. Yeah. But clearly the aim is not to bamboozle people <laughs> with science and theoretical concepts. Uh, it's a tricky challenge, you know, so it's, it's, it's absolutely um, spot on as a point for discussion. It's a tricky challenge. Uh, I think we're now at the stage of being able to maybe go a little bit more into the practical applications. Um, and this is where I really feel that we need to empower coaches. You know, I talk, earlier I talked about people inhabiting that space where theory and practice is deeply integrated, where they can enrich each other. Yeah. Well, coaches can enrich uh, coaches, practitioners, uh, people involved in, in uh, sport to a, you know, at a very practical level, can enrich the sort of... Uh, the scientific theoretical explanations by giving good practical examples and I think again go back to um, I'm not his agent by the way I, <laughs> I'm not I'm on, a, on a retainer um, you know going back to um, video YouTube, YouTube clips that Ben's done um, on concepts like affordance I think they're really they're a really good conversation starter yeah if you like and I think um, what we were just talking about earlier as well is is that um, whether it whether it's a, a video or a podcast the idea is is that this is never going to replace the kind of richness that you would get from some proper inquiry by looking into what is, you know, it's a significant body of research. Yes. Um, but um, it, it acts as a kind of thought stimulus to go, actually, I want to know more about yes. that. Right, now I'm going to dig into That's it. That's it. Yeah. That's exactly right. It's but whereas in itself. Yeah. It invites you. Yeah, it's, it's an opportunity. It's an invitation. That's great. That's a really good way of looking at those video clips, yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that's what I was saying saying earlier is, is that you almost need to create um, a landing place mm. so that people can actually connect with something which yeah. then sparks the curiosity yes. to begin further inquiry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And actually, um, another point I want to make on that is by having that deeper, richer understanding that you can get to, you can make decisions, critical decisions about whether you accept uh, the principles of practice or not. It yeah, may yeah. well be yeah, that you yeah, decide, yeah. no, actually... For this explanation, my conceptual understanding leads me to believe that this is not the way to coach. Mm. You know, I'm perfectly open to that. Now, actually, while we talk about this, I'm not. Um, I'm conscious that actually there might be some people who have no idea what we're talking about. Mm. Um, we're talking about a book that they've never seen or heard of. <laughs> so, um, I'd, I'd be interested though, just to sort of 
get, I guess, a, 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 I know you, I don't expect you to sum up the entire book in a pithy statement, but, yeah. but actually, interestingly, you decided to call it non linear pedagogy yes, in skill yes. acquisition. Yeah. So there must be some rationale behind that. I'd be interested to find out. Yeah, more. the rationale really is to use a catchy uh, title. Um, really, the uh, pedagogical approach is, is based on. Um, an understanding of uh, humans, uh, athletes and sports teams uh, or people engaged in physical activity um, in sport, um, imagining them as or conceptualising them as complex adaptive systems. Um, but rather than write a book that was um, pedagogical principles for humans and sports teams as complex adaptive <laughs> systems. <laughs> I thought that wouldn't sell very well. We went for a non-linear pedagogy. So it's not the pedagogy that's non-linear. Mm. It's a pedagogy for humans and sports teams as non-linear complex adaptive systems. Okay. Um, so even the very idea of a complex adaptive system, it'd be worth expanding on that a little yeah, bit more. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so a complex adaptive system is... Uh, people um, may not conceptually understand it, but um, they're surrounded by it. We, we, we're surrounded by complex adaptive systems. So complexity in scientific technical terms means it's a system that's made up of two or more interacting parts. And you, you, you think about the human body, the brain, you think about societies, sports teams. So an athlete, a complex uh, system. An adaptive system means that um, these systems are made up of two or more interacting parts are constantly interacting with environments, tasks, environments, whether it's the social environment, the physical environment, uh, the biological environment, etc. In other words, you cannot s study the athlete or a sports team separately from the environmental surround. So that's, that's the, the basis of a complex adaptive system. It's looking at people, athletes, and sports teams embedded within systems. Mm. And they go as far as you want to go mm. on that one. Yeah. yeah, so there's like, there's the, I guess there's the, almost that individual system, which is the pure human being themselves, yep. um, and what's going on in and around them, and That's how they're right. interacting with environments through sensations, etc. That's right, yeah. And then you go up to, that might be in a team context, where yep. they've got to interact with other human beings, yes, yes, yes. and there's an opponent, yes. who they've got to interact with as well. That's right. Or, or, um, and then, and then you go beyond, beyond that, and then there's a society that we all exist yeah. within, yeah. and there's rules. And I've talked to James Vaughan in the past about how interesting it's interesting to see how cultures yes. affect the way different yeah. societies operate at this level, yeah, yeah. and then right all the way up to sort of almost humanity's level, I suppose. Uh, and then beyond. And beyond. Know, with with, with um, uh, at, at, the, at the moment of this broadcast, you know, the, the news that China has landed on the, the dark side of the moon, and, and uh, people are trying to now explore. Uh, other planets, etc. We're part of a, you know, a galaxy and um, uh, planetary systems beyond that, even. So, uh, it, as I said, you can go as far as you, you want on that. But there are certain dimensions uh, social dimensions, physical dimensions, um, biological dimensions, and uh, you're right, they relate to the individual, mm. uh, but also the individual embedded in the context, the wider context, etc. Uh, it's interesting to put that in a practical perspective. There's a wonderful article um, about Dan Carter, um, the New Zealand uh, All Black great, one of the great um, uh, backs of, um, uh, of New Zealand rugby in recent times, talking about how perplexed he was when he first arrived um, to play for Racing 92 in Paris, mm. this club. And he came from this New Zealand culture, different approach to rugby playing. And he said he was shocked at how quiet the players were in the dressing room and the coach would be the only one who spoke and the coach would give instructions and the idea was to follow the instructions and he said he had to bite his lip because <laughs> he said in, in um, New Zealand he was pretty much used to everyone giving their opinion and even on field he said he was used to playing what you see in front of you and if, even if it went against a game plan whereas here uh, in in, um, in Europe, it seems to be that uh, in, in particularly the European Rugby Union, teams play in a certain way where the coach is the one who dictates the strategy. There is a game plan. You stick with the game plan, even if you can see an opportunity, an affordance, as you talked about, to uh, do something really useful. But when against game, you don't you don't you don't take it. You just stick with the game plan. 
I've got I've got an interesting point on that. When I'm in in uh, Uganda, the boys um, they're used to it now, but when they started, they never had done a warm up in the whole entire life, and they've never gone to a change room. Why would you? Well, <laughs> yeah, they'd never they'd never gone to a change room before a game or anything like that. Mm. They used to like used to getting changed just in a bus or yeah, <laughs> wherever yeah, wherever yeah. you can get changed. Yeah, yeah. So it was when we were wearing boots, even yeah. wearing boots yes, for them yes, was yes. so... They had to get used to a lot yeah. of the players that we have. We have new players coming now. We have to give them boots. It's the first time they've worn boots. Wow. So that's a completely different amazing. feeling to yeah, yeah. what they're used to before. So it's, it's fascinating watching them yeah. get used to wearing boots even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and getting used to using change rooms or getting used to doing like we do a little warm up before yeah. the game that for them is so so very yeah. different I, I wonder if sometimes if it's worthwhile even just not doing the warm up whether that affects their performance in some way yeah. because they're it's too structured or it's too it changes emotionally how they're psychologically how they're going into the game well I think that's really that's a really good example of um you know, uh, of a complex adaptive system where you've got um, different sort of influences, S- societies, yeah. culture, um, economics, uh, clearly, um, different contexts. Uh, and so just simply taking a, a, a good athlete or a good coach from uh, one context or society and then embedding them in another, that <laughs> may not necessarily lead to um, the, the, the outcomes that people thought were going to emerge. I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because it um, happens all the time. So people will say, oh, we're coming from, from Europe and um, we're going to make an academy here in, in Africa. So I know of people who have big, big money, sponsorship money to build and make, make a new academy in Africa. And our director goes... You have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea what you. Well, you can't just bring this this German system or this English system yes. and bring the African boys and yeah, yeah. the Ugandan boys through that. Great, great example. It, it doesn't work. Great, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can imagine it causes some dissonance, and there needs to be. It needs to be carefully embedded. Uh, it, um, there's a there's a mixture that has to. And it's a challenging thing to navigate your way through that. Absolutely. Because one of the end goals is to get the boys to go overseas because there's further opportunity for them overseas. There's not the opportunity that they would get in Uganda, what they can get overseas. So we have a boy in Canada right now. Right. Um, He got a full scholarship to a school in Canada for football. Um, But he's now, he he lived in a grass hut. And now he's yeah, yeah, yeah. he's in Canada at a, a very posh boarding school, yeah, yeah, yeah. and figuring that all out. Major adaptations needed. Yeah. Play, playing on artificial turf. Yeah. Well, I, I, a lot, on a similar level, though, even within a, within a country. So uh, when I was uh, working in rugby, I went out to spend some time with um, uh, the South African Rugby Union. Mm. I was at conference with um, speaking at a conference. Um, uh, for uh, within one of the universities there, mm. and while I was there, I spent some time with the South African Rugby, and they were looking at us because we'd just won the Under Twenties World Cup mm. at that time. Mm. And uh, they said, "What are you guys doing? What are you, what are you mm. doing? What's your secret <laughs> sauce?" You know, <laughs> that's right. Uh, and they talked at the time, and we had a really nice, wide-ranging conversation. And I explained a lot about our system and all mm. these sorts of things, and the pros and cons, and all that. Mm. But one of the things they talked about was the challenges they have with getting players, you know, essentially black South African boys mm-hmm. into the international setup mm. because the problem they have is that their entire system is based around 40 schools oh yes, yes largely yes, yeah. largely white dominated yeah, yeah. with white culture white ethos yeah, yeah, yeah. and they're taking these kids and implanting them into those mm-hmm. cultures mm-hmm. and it, it, it's very difficult to yeah, yeah. assimilate yeah, yeah. and buy into these new ideas and mm. so they actually lose a lot of fantastic talent mm. because of the fact that they can't create this assimilation yeah, yeah, and I said well why is that your only system <laughs> why is that the only route and it, I could see there was a look at, a look as if to go well that's it's always been like that's that. it yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. always been like that yeah I've seen I've heard of things like that before and um, in um, education that's called acculturation um, where for example there may be a certain pedagogical practice yeah. approach to teaching or learning design and uh, some people will stick with what they know, uh, and then if you challenge them on it, you know, uh, in the sense that um, 
just asking them you know, why you're doing that, why not do it a different way. Um, the response is, well, it's, it's the way I was taught, or it's always yeah. been like that, or it's in the manual. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the point, the point is, that, and I think this is the thing about a complex adaptive system in in life, is that it's constantly changing, right. constantly changing over different timescales, whether the timescale is very, very minute, the here and now, perception and action, or over the timescale of development and learning, um, over over um, months and years and decades, it's constantly changing. Mm. And so doing things the way that it's always been done is not a good approach. That doesn't mean you throw everything out. Mm. Clearly you've got to work out what's working for you, what's part of your, uh, if you like, your socio-cultural constraints that help you to uh, achieve what you can achieve as a group, a society or a community. But equally, um, things are changing in life and so it's about being aware of what is working. Not just, um, as we've said, taking something, a player or a coach or a method and just implanting it, embedding it right in the middle and expecting it to function like it and flourish like it does, but working out how it can be integrated as part of a wider complex adaptive system. And that, that I think, is where non-linear pedagogical principles can help. Now, that's interesting. Again, this is something we were talking about on the way up here. Um, so... One of the things that I can't, I, I find myself wrestling with quite a bit, mm. um, talking about these issues is, needless to say, it incurs um, some negativity. Mm. Mm. Feels a little bit to me like, I mean, this seems to be happening all across the world, where mm. there's almost like a conservatism mm. that is uh, becoming increasingly vehement, mm. which is sort of saying we want things to be either as they are or as they were, mm. because it was better then. Mm versus this sort of um, drive of modernity mm, mm. often characterised by liberal political mm. ideology mm. which is sort of suggesting that there's new ways, we need to be open to these ideas, we need to explore mm. we need to discover more, we need to understand more about the human condition mm. and I feel that these things are increasingly becoming, a, there's like a tension between them yeah, yeah. and in, in our world I feel this a lot which mm. is there's a, I, get, I get a lot of uh, sort of quite challenging um, feedback from, from people basically saying um, this is mumbo jumbo mm, right mm, it's voodoo mm. right there's no evidence base or there's, it's not strong enough or this that and the other and therefore you know it's not valid actually there's evidence to suggest that well, what I am currently doing works yeah. in inverted commas yeah, yeah. Um, and therefore we should stick with that because it, until we know more about this new stuff yeah yeah, yeah. now we're sort of saying well which, which way should we go here because it feels to me mm. I'm going to make a lot of points so sorry about this but mm, it, feels to right. me, it feels to me like um, once you sort of begin to start exploring in this world mm. it becomes increasingly difficult to hold on to mm. traditional approaches yeah, yeah, yeah. and I've gone to the point of just leaving them behind altogether <laughs> because yeah. I just can't logically yeah. connect the two together anymore yeah, there's yeah. just too much of a stretch yeah, yeah, yeah. but we were sort of debating well what's the right way to go here because mm. it might be too scary for someone to just literally go mm. right I'm leaving behind everything I've learned for the last 25 years yeah. and starting again yeah, yeah, yeah. you know so they might need a landing point and they need to explore in this mm. but at the same time the danger then is you get this kind of mixed message mm. that doesn't quite work mm -hmm. so there's a lot in that and I don't want I don't expect to unpack it all but yeah, yeah, yeah. just any thoughts yeah yeah no I, I mean it's something that I do think about um, fairly frequently I mean it, you know I think one of the things that is quite um, frightening for some people and bewildering is change mm. but if there's one of the things that's most sure in life is change <laughs> you know um, just think of our own journey uh, our own individual journey from um, when we were an infant through childhood adolescence young adulthood um, and then in, in the case of some of us here uh, older <laughs> adulthood um, uh, you know you, you can you, every day if you look in the mirror you may not see the changes but then over time there is change going on um, and uh, for me uh, this it's a really good point that you make from a wider philosophical um, discussion Stuart that uh, changes are going on um, in societies across the world politically economically Technologically, mm. you know, we've talked about this recently. Massive changes going on, mm. and they all have implications. Yeah. They, these changes 
um, don't just happen in the vacuum. Yeah. You know, they're embedded in our context, etc. And it's the same in sport. There are uh, there's new technology, there's new equipment design, there's new rules br- brought in, there's new sport formats, yeah. new competitions. Um, there was a, a new football competition brought in Europe this this summer, 2018, um, and they all have implications for um, all sorts of things: how we prepare players, how we uh, how players recover if yeah. they're being um, performing in lots of different competitions how they integrate with new technology, with new systems. Uh, and so you, you've got to adapt and change with it. There's, there's no question about that. I mean, I understand where people might feel um, a little bit um, uh, undermined by the, 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 the pace of change, you know. And, it, and again, as a, I do want to reiterate that, that it's not a question of mindlessly throwing out everything that you um, thought was valid few years ago and then just starting again from afresh it's about integrating new approaches critically evaluating them and that's what people are saying is from from what you're saying Stuart they're looking at it and going not for me at the moment this approach it's a bit too avant-garde or Mm. or whatever it doesn't suit me Um, but at the end of the day I think that uh, all of us um, I go back to that um, Sheffield Hallam University um, strategic plan mission statement We all want to transform lives. We don't want to be just doing things for the sake of it and it's not transforming people's lives. We want to um, help more people get into sport, to be the best that they can, to um, participate in exercise and physical activity, etc. And so embracing some new methods, keeping some uh, or even slightly modifying some that you've got, if if that works for some people, that's great. And then the, the, this issue around evidence base. Mm. I mean, as somebody who's probably got more of a in-depth understanding of this emerging evidence base, mm. and it is emerging. Yes, yes. Um, and some of the limits of our evidence base are just limits of pure technology, and yeah. some of our research methods yes. just just struggle to be able to keep up Good to point. date. Good point. Um, but within that idea of there being either a limited or a lacking evidence base, mm-hmm. is that something that you would challenge, I assume? Yeah, and, and uh, it's, it's not something that, that, that I accept. Um, I think that uh, there are a few caveats, obviously, mm-hmm. but um, that in terms of um, a scientific theory, uh, conceptualisation, complex adaptive systems have a very powerful evidence base, very strong evidence base, uh, over 100 years worth of research, maybe more. Um, and, and from disciplines like chemistry, biology, physics, astronomy, you know, um, that sort of thing, uh, the, there, is, there is a lot of uh, evidence that um, complex adaptive systems describe phenomena in, in, in the natural physical world. Uh, and, and sport and um, exercise and human behaviour in those contexts is no different. It's not some uh, separate uh, universe that exists away from these uh, theoretical ideas. So all we've done is look at um, uh, that um, ontology for describing uh, certain phenomena or ways of ways, ways of knowing, if you like, um, understanding those phenomena, and then applied them to the um, uh, sport and exercise and physical activity context. Um, the evidence base for their practical utility is emerging, as you say, but I think it, it is a bit of a misconception that there's no evidence because we, there's, there's about two decades' worth of evidence where um, we've looked at coordination and control in, uh, in athletes and, in, and in, in between athletes in sports teams, etc. We looked at perception and action, perception action coupling, affordances, etc. All of those in sport physical activity, exercise context. Um, the notion of them working in terms of a pedagogical approach, um, that is a little bit more fraught with challenges in terms of um, the ethics of really conducting uh, what you could call experiments, um, doing that. You, you just can't do that because um, there are ethical issues that athletes and clubs and organisations and uh, Players, etc. That you know, you have to consider that. I think what's um, it's, it's emerging, and I think that one of the big growth areas in future research will be the evidence that comes from practitioners, 
you know, we shouldn't be brainwashed and thinking that the only evidence that is really worthwhile is the evidence that scientists pick up from experimental studies in laboratories in a university or in a, a research institute. That's not the case. Um, there's different types of knowledge that you can gain, different types of evidence that can um, either support or reject an approach or even help you to modify an approach. And I think we should work harder to explore the day-to-day -day evidence that um, sports practitioners gain in their practice as they... Um, you know, as they as they work with athletes and uh, help to transform the lives of athletes. And I think a good example is where Ben talked about coming in and wanting to use certain approaches um, in in uh, with, with his group in Uganda, and then looking at the evidence that confronted him and made him realise actually I might need to adapt. I might need to change the way I do things, my practice here, because. Um, this isn't working properly. This isn't working the way that it might work if I went and coached a group of Australians or a group in the, in the UK. Um, and so for me, that's all evidence and knowledge that shouldn't be underplayed mm. just because it's not um, gained in an experiment setting in a, in a laboratory. And, and that leads me to a um, really nice piece of work that I think that Dominic Orth's done oh, yeah. um, on the coach as... Uh, uh, an adaptive system mm. but also uh, as being situated with the learners yes. as opposed to the idea of the coach being the controller of the learning mm. environment but mm. being part of the learning yes. environment yes. and that's a really interesting way of conceiving of coaches because it goes back to what Ben was talking about there which is I spoke to you about this before of you know the form of life mm. so the idea of that the, the methodology or the approach that we would take would be determined by the environment within which we operate and the learners within which we are, the learners we are we are learning with mm -hmm. that's really interesting idea because i think that fundamentally changes the way we even conceive of 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 the engagement yes. the engagement is, is i know stuff yeah, yes, right? yes. and i've got this clever methodology and i've actually fallen foul of this myself you know I feel like i'm a puppet master with my <laughs> with my constraints you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> ah, let me see how i can manipulate these people and bring about this behavior change yeah, yeah. but actually you're not thinking about that you're in it with them yes and that you're actually reacting to them as much as they're reacting to you exactly right yeah i, I completely agree with it so f first of all I'll, I'll i'll talk about dominic orth now you mentioned before about QT being a hotbed yeah. of talent and <laughs> skill acquisition and expertise, you know, where Ben uh, yeah. is currently uh, registered for his master's um, degree. Uh, Dominic Orth um, was an undergrad there, and um, uh, he did a master's degree there, and then he did a PhD there, or actually he transferred to do his PhD at the University of Rouen in France, and he's currently at the Free University of Amsterdam mm. um, in the Netherlands and a uh, very, very smart guy, very, very smart, knows the science really well and is, is getting much better at uh, applying it to practical applications, etc. To go back to um, the point that he raised there, I think this is a new challenge. I think this is um, an important challenge that, uh, that, that really I, I, I think uh, sports practitioners could embrace and that is to find new models of coaching, new models of engaging with athletes, as you say, new models of sports science support, new models of preparing athletes for performance, uh, and not uh, moving away from this top-down, hierarchical, traditional system that in, in, in countries like the UK, for example, still dominates a little bit. You know, Martin Rothwell's work has um, showed that when he talks about forms of life mm. and how that was influenced by the, um, if you like, the industrial heritage of, of um, the UK, um, where the factory owner would dictate what the um, individual operators would do um, in the manufacturing setting, and that was translated was translated to traditional coaching models, which is where the coach would dictate what athletes do. Remember, that's what Dan Carter was railing against yeah, yeah, yeah. when he came to um, Europe. Um, I, I think um, the challenge will be for coaching and sports science support um, and applied practice in sport is to find new ways of, of, of getting the best out of athletes, of transforming them um, in terms of uh, making the most out of their contributions to sport performance, etc. Um, and I'm not going to, I'm not a coach, so I'm not going to dictate what those new models would be. But what I can do is, if you like, present some ideas. Um, and concepts that might help the coaches to be innovative. Um, and again, that doesn't mean throwing out um, everything they've done, but really evaluating what they've done in the past and saying, uh, one, does that work? 
and if it did work in the past, um, did I only get through about 10% of the athletes that I could have got through? Did I, did I switch off? Did I turn off more athletes than I actually, that actually came through the system? Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's about not, it, not necessarily saying, oh, we've always done it this way and look, look uh, you know, I've got a couple of gold medalists and that means that the methods are good and they don't need to change. It might well be that they need to be modified or adapted. Um, uh, and certainly uh, one that looks at empowering athletes where the coach, coach works with them, where the athlete is genuinely at the centre of the learning process, I think that could be the way forward in the future. It's interesting because I ask a question quite often when I'm doing like, workshops and I'll probably ask it later today. Why do you coach the way you coach? Mm. And it's quite an interesting but quite fundamental question that I don't think people are asked often enough. Yes. And certainly the responses I get suggest that. Yes. Um, often the responses are, I had this experience as a participant and I didn't want that for myself or others. And that's quite an interesting one. Yeah. The other one might be, or, or the opposite is, I had this experience as a participant and I wanted to emulate that. Yes. Uh, quite often it's this is what they were taught me on my course yes um, very rarely is it based on any if you like theoretical understanding yeah. of human beings and how they learn yeah. and that's one of the interesting things that I want to try and explore with people a little bit is the idea of if you uh, if you align if you're aligned or you have a particular uh, position around the way the learning process might happen mm -hmm. you know um I like to think of it using sort of Dominic's idea of as, a, as a, almost like a, a, a co-creative experience. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, co-designing. Co-design, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Co-adaptation. Yeah, yeah. So if it's like that, and that, and, and it's you know you you and me, athlete, mm. me coach yeah. on a journey together. Yeah, yeah. Um, then that leads you down a different a, approach. Yes. Um, yeah. And methodologically, you have to you have to shift in that way yeah, yeah. because right. the minute. I tell you what to do. Yeah, yes. Well, all of a sudden, we've changed the dynamics yes, of our relationship, right. haven't we? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, and, I, and that can happen. Yeah, that can, and it's perfectly feasible for that to happen. Um, and there may be times when uh, you know you, you're sort of uh, an athlete, maybe completely out of their depth, where they look to the coach and they and need something. And they need something immediately, and and it could be an instruction or it could be um, you know a, a direction, etc. And yeah. that's fine. I just think that that method is overused. Uh, it's a little bit tired. The instructional. The instructional yeah. directive approach, yeah. prescriptive approach. Yeah. Um, and it's it's something that could be explored. I mean, I think for me, um, um, it could be a very exciting, innovative way to go about this journey mm. of um, mentoring somebody, guiding somebody, advising them, supporting them yeah. to become the best that they can in a particular context. Remember, the context is changing as well, yeah. you know, um, and, and I think, uh, you know, I mean, what a wonderful relationship that would be, you know, in terms of co-designing, co-creating, um, co-adapting together. But if, if you never ask the question and you're never open to alternative methodologies, yeah. what often happens, and we were talking about this as well, it's is that people assume you just need more. So the idea is, is that right, I'm not getting the outcomes yes. I'm looking for with yeah. my instructions. That's it. I need more. Yeah, yeah. More instructions. That's or right. I need more control. Yeah. Or more, more structure. Or more repetitive practice, <laughs> you know, because... If I only, um, had enough, only had more hours. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's exactly right, yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think that's what, um, you know, what, what could uh, emerge from these new models of coaching, uh, which may be more about co-designing uh, and certainly emphasising learning much more rather than teaching, instructing, directing. Um, what, you know, the, the outcome of that could be uh, quite innovative, uh, challenging, uh, really engaging journeys together um, in, in, in sports where, uh, in sports and exercise context where people can um, solve problems and adapt to you know, the changes that, that are emerging. Um, and for me, um, that, that, could not, that will impact on wider sports organisations, systems for athlete um, talent development, um, for coach education, um, uh, for um, sports science support, all the, all the sports science support um, uh, approaches. And one of, we've, we've just submitted a paper actually just this last week where we've talked about, um, provocatively we've argued that uh, we think that sports organisations need a department of methodology. Yeah. Uh, and on the face of that, that might be a superficial comment to make, but we unpack that and we talk about the, the notion of a department of methodology is where 
groups of people are working together, I mean athletes and the coaches, the sports science uh, practitioners, to uh, achieve certain uh, organisational goals, yep. which might be to develop a certain number of athletes, to get them through to a certain level, it might be to win certain tournaments, competitions, etc., all working together as, um, with, with a particular framework. One framework could be ecological dynamics, yeah. as we've talked about, using principles of non-linear pedagogy, um, th- but there are other frameworks. What that would avoid would be to have these sort of people working in isolation, yes. where you've got strength and conditioning specialists, sports psychologists, coaches, um, and then, if you like, the athlete is almost like a commodity passed around, yeah. rather than being at the centre of the operations where everybody um, integrates their understanding, their knowledge, their skills and supports the athlete in terms of achieving what he or she can can do the best. Some, some of the most high-performing organized, sports organisations in the world, let's say the All Blacks as an example, mm. have that. Mm. Whether it's explicitly referenced yes. as that yes. so I mean Gilbert Anoka probably played that role a little bit yes. I guess Yes. Um, he will most act as the bridge between athlete coach mm-hmm. in terms of connecting the two things together but yeah. more f- he was t- t- doing it more from a psychological perspective yeah, yeah, yeah. but his work was probably more with the coaches than it was with the athletes ah, okay. interestingly yeah, or from what I've read mm. but um, in, going back to the point about this idea of a department of methodology the other potential real benefit is not only creating increased synergy between a sports science mm. practitioners mm. Um, and and how they can then integrate with athlete mm. and there's some really interesting work being being, do, being done by Andrew Gillett um, so Andrew is, is uh, based with the English Institute of Sport he's been on the podcast a couple of weeks ago um, and in between basically me just falling about laughing while I was doing a podcast with him mm. there were some points he made but one of the points he made was uh, his work with NEIS is actually to try and create that um, that piece of work where you're bringing this trying to pull together the various and helping coaches to be part of that process nice, nice. so they almost can uh, harmonise for the athletes yeah, yeah, if yeah. you like um, but interestingly on that methodological piece the other benefit it brings and I was working with a sports organisation quite intently recently where what they discovered was there's, there's, a, there's a desire to work in a more non-linear way mm. but there's a pervasive culture mm. that is, is that's not like that and a yes. curriculum yes. that is not the yes. curriculum is very prescriptive yeah, yeah. you must be at this stage by this stage yes. otherwise they get rid of you yes yes very linear very linear yeah. so you've got yeah, a yeah. linear curriculum but a non-linear approach mm. methodologically and they're at odds mm. and the coaches were actually wrestling with that kind mm. of live in this experience and wow. I was saying well we might need to review if you're really dedicated to a non-linear approach you might yeah, need yeah. to review your curricula yeah, yeah. but likewise what often happens methodologically is a new head coach arrives mm. and they say no no this is the way yeah and then either yeah. all the other people who are in that system get they get rid of to bring in the people who do who, yes. who align to that system. Yes, yes, yes. Or the people in the system have to adapt and go. Oh, okay. Well, we're going to have to do it this yes, way now. Yeah. And forget the athletes; they yeah. just have to deal with it. That's right. Yeah, that's <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, and and then yeah, not exactly at the centre of that um, learning process, development process, etc. But yeah, I mean, it, it, this is exactly what Martin Rothwell's PhD um, program of research is at Sheffield Hallam University. Martin is looking at forms of life. Forms of life, um, it's a philosophical concept introduced by Wittgenstein, the German philosopher, um, who talked about um, values, habits, customs, beliefs, skills, uh, approaches um, as a form of life. It it, it, um, it composes a form of life. Um, And what you've talked about there is is absolutely right. If you've got this sort of conceptual framework that is kind of inherently non-linear, and sees an athlete as a complex adaptive system or a sports team as a complex adaptive system. But the structures, the organisational linear, um, then you're going to get some dissonance. And that might cause some issues in terms of progress, etc., um, which then people can point to and say, well, it hasn't worked. Uh, but it may well be that the, the, the system is not in harmony with the, the way that the, the approach to... Um, so, so really, I guess in, in that respect, the coaches, the practitioners need to adapt as well. You know, the, um, uh, and, 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 the, and it's worth, the, they need to be working, functioning in a system that is consonant with their approach. It can't be at the whim of a change of leadership, otherwise you're a hostage yeah. to fortune. Yeah, you you know, the, the, I think the one thing that I, f- I feel whenever I've spoken with various different organisations who are involved in, say, 
talent development and also then ultimately performance is yeah. they have a core a kind of core belief system yes right yeah. that that um, they hold on to yeah and, and they recruit coaches or yeah. leaders or whoever yeah. against that system or that that view of how the organization should operate yeah. as opposed to right um, we we're the, the system is going to be defined by whoever the leader is yeah um, and then that will work for a period of time. Right now, change of leader, complete change of system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not ever going to get any continuity with that. Yes. Now, it may, that's not to say that you don't like say, oh, actually, we're going to modify the system, that's we're going it. to make the system develop or whatever. It's not adapt rigid. It. Yeah, 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 adapt yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but it, it, that's very different from saying, oh, well, well we used to do that. We're not do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. Now we're going to do this. Yeah. And, and I, I, I accept that point. You do see lots of examples of that in, uh, surprisingly, in high-level professional sport as well. Oh, you know, yeah. This notion of revolution yeah. rather than evolution, and um, unfortunately, sometimes revolution goes hand in hand with throwing money at things yeah. as well. Um, and rather than um, sticking with um, systems and then improving the function of that system as you say modifying adapting and changing over yeah. time yeah yeah and, and it's interesting isn't it because it's tempting with a lot of organizations to think that there's some sort of magic dust around the corner yes, yes, like yeah. oh if we just get the right coach yeah yeah, yeah we'll yeah. be fine yes you know yeah yeah and then and then, and then you basically then it, uh, in this horrible you veer from one minor crisis to another yeah <laughs> and, and 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 essentially um I mean, that, that is actually quite prevalent, you know, so it'll be, uh, who, who are the world champions at the moment? Who are the, who yeah. are the number one? Who, who um, are succeeding at the moment? Okay, we want to copy them. Yeah. We're going to copy their model because obviously they it's yeah. successful. Or let's bring in um, their head coach or one of their coaches. Let's bring in some of their players. And it goes back to this point of embedding them in the context, <laughs> a form of life that's completely different. And that will lead to dissonance and, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's not really... Uh, and, and I guess it goes back to that point about the um, Department of Methodology. Uh, it provides a conceptual framework, and if you've got that at the organisational level, that that will also consider the social, cultural, historical context. And um, not so much about maintaining it, but about, okay, if we bring in a person from outside, what does that person bring in? And how can that person uh, be integrated into our system, but also improve our system? So it's not a question of bringing in that person yeah. and saying that they're going to have to fit with our system, which, by the way, isn't really working that well. Yeah. Um, it's about saying, well, what can they contribute? How can they uh, achieve some meaningful change in this space of time? Um, and where can we go from there? So it's really about understanding how, uh, go back to that, what I said before about this complex adaptive system of a sports organisation can evolve and change in certain ways. Mm. And sometimes these changes, you know, this is the point about a, uh, the people um, might not understand clearly about a complex adaptive system. I, I made the point early on that they're constantly changing at different timescales. Sometimes a certain change doesn't lead to... Uh, much of a transition of system, sometimes the same change can lead to a whole different, um, completely different. Thing. Just think of it. The big from, bang. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. It's a big, well, just think of it this way. Um, if you were um, a student and you were getting marked for um, a project or um, you know, a piece of work and uh, a change between 2% of 2% in a mark may not be that important at a certain level. So if you're on 55 uh, percent for a, a grading and you go to 57 or you go to 53 no problem. It, it's not going to really affect you that much. If you're on 69 percent a two percent increase could take you to another category of degree level award so the same percentage value can have a major effect on your um, future your performance outcome uh, at another level and that's how to look at a complex adaptive system etc relatively minor changes can have quite significant knock-on effects. That's right. But you've got to take account of the socio-cultural, environmental factors that um, will either facilitate uh, a change that you want or will, uh, as I say, cause the dissonance or inhibit the change. That's where pace of change is often so important. I mean, I've experienced this myself, okay. um, where 
you know, I had an epiphany. <laughs> I had, an, had a moment where I realised that everything I'd been doing up to this point in time was, um, you know, just was wrong or wasn't achieving the outcomes I was expect, I was hoping to achieve. You know, I was one of those people who, um, in an effort to bring about the achievement, I wanted more control, more structure, oh, more okay. order, yeah, yeah. more time. Yeah, I was yeah. one of those people. Yeah. And I had this, had this sort of epiphany that, you know, I was going in the wrong way, partly to do with Shuttleworth um, <laughs> and people like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, um, I had this sort of change of approach, change of viewpoint, change of thought process. And then I then thought, right, here's the new way. So now it's like, okay, solve the problem. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, here's the new approach. Mm-hmm. And the people who I was working with just lost their minds <laughs> because mm-hmm. that it was too much of a shift. Yes, it was yes. too big a jump. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. we had a significant performance drop as a result. <laughs> of course. Of course yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Because what I hadn't expect, uh, understood and accepted was that as I adapt, I can't expect them to adapt in the same way I have. Yes, I've yes. got a new conceptual understanding, yes, yes. but they haven't yet. Yes, that's right. And I talk about almost like a periodization of methodology. Oh, nice. It's almost yeah. like I have to phase wow. it in. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's I don't know if it's the right term, but it's, yeah. the, it's just the no, way no. I conceive of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost, at, but also to bring the athlete on the journey. Mm. You can't just go, right, by the way, mm. I'm, no, you know, I'm just going to ask you a load of questions and not tell you what to do. And they go, yeah, just yeah, tell yeah. me what to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And go, no, oh, hang on a second. Well, <laughs> So I, I, you know, you can't just do that because then there's a lot of things can happen. One yeah. of them is they lose faith in you. Yeah, yeah. They don't talk, they don't listen to you anymore. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, oh, he doesn't care. Yeah, yeah. You know, they can all have all sorts of. They misinterpret the, yeah. your your motives. Um, that's right. And Interestingly, I, I've had the exact opposite experience <laughs> because I've gone from being all in constraints and obviously doing my masters and and researching these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and coming from an environment where in Australia where you can ask questions and you can do these things and challenge them and the kids are, are more than happy to or feel safe enough to be able to do that mm-hmm. whereas the, you go to Africa yeah. um, and they come from culturally from a background where and school and education system where challenging the teacher or expressing yourself is yeah. is not accepted yeah, so yeah, yeah. I've had to pull back in terms of what I'm doing and adapt myself in the way that yeah. I'm approaching my own coaching yeah. um to fit them yeah, and yeah. to then move them closer and closer to move you're going to become a monstrous them. autocrat aren't you <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's 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 fascinating to to be in that position where I've come from probably the other side to everyone else yeah, yeah. and had to become more central and yeah. move move back towards the other the other that's, side yeah a very good point you see and that's exactly why the learner should always be at the centre yeah, of their the needs. learning process yeah. Yeah. what their needs are what the history has been of course what, you know, their background their context uh, and that for me is proper teaching proper coaching rather than uh, coming in with a model that you're going to superimpose on a group or a person regardless of what their needs are I- interesting point you made about this sort of um, okay problem solving exploration etc some really good research by uh, James Gibson's wife Eleanor Gibson uh, motor development with yep. infants and um, what she's found is that um, uh, people's ability to explore or adapt to the unfamiliar uh, if they're put in a situation where they um, really um, have never been in before etc um, that varies so much and some of it at least part of their uh, response of, the, of people is down to uh, attachment style of the infant to the parent right yeah and um, where they where, where um, infants have had um, a positive attachment style with a parent supportive mentoring and they feel comfortable um, the infant is able to uh, and then consequently the um, the child and the adult younger adult etc is able to adapt and explore comfortably and they're able to cope with the unfamiliar um, but where the attachment style was pretty much um, uh, to do with uh, an autocratic parent a cold emotional parent someone who didn't uh, provide uh, nurture and support in an unfamiliar setting that uh, child felt very uncomfortable when faced with novel stimuli, unfamiliar stimuli. So at least some athletes uh, will struggle with this um, problem solving, lack of, uh, in a situation where they're thinking, I don't know what to do here, 
what do I do? Please tell me what to do. It's too uncomfortable. And it's absolutely right. And it might be to do with attachment style, but equally it could be due, due to lack of experience. Um, that they simply um, have only ever experienced from uh, youth sport during youth sport their their um, progressive development years. They've only ever experienced uh, a certain style of teaching, coaching, traditional, which was very much about instruction, direction, and to suddenly then confront them with a, okay, well you're now responsible. You know, you decide what to do. You solve the problem. I'll just create my role as a coach is to design the problems if you dissolve. To, to resolve and the problems are based on what you're going to face in competition that takes a big conceptual leap for some athletes that, uh, go on and, uh, I think that's where we have to be quite careful and as, as a coach mm. you, if, you're, if you start going down the ecological approach or in constraints based learning you can't it's, uh, it's about being um, having the, the athlete in mind and being able to at times give informational constraints mm. using your voice or using um, your body language or anything yes. that can help them yes. in that situation and that's that's the very very good coaches yeah, yeah. that's the art of co- that's the, the beauty of coaching the yes. art of coaching that I comes like out that. Yeah. because okay now and sometimes it's not telling them sometimes it's clapping sometimes mm-hmm. it's the way your face is yeah. the it, it like, depends on the culture yeah, of well, course yeah, yeah. but like you see um, coaches yelling on the sideline or yeah. running up and down on the sideline. Look at Jurgen Klopp and what he can do yeah, yeah, to yeah. a football team. Yeah. Look at what I, I remember watching Atletico Madrid once and Simeone ran on the field. He was five <laughs> metres on the field and they're one nil down. Yeah. They go on to win 2 1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he changed the whole environment yeah, yeah. of the game. Oh, yeah, it was yeah. a dull it's, game. It's not an accident. It's not an accident. Yeah. They do this on purpose. Yeah, they do, yeah. And I'm, I'm not saying, okay, we want youth coaches running up and down the sideline screaming at the players, yeah, but yeah. I'm saying that we, it's not just about being silent. There is times where we can do things with our emotion, with our body. Yeah, yeah. Non-verbals and not, stuff like that, yeah. I completely agree. I think, I, think um, I guess the underlying message there for coaches and practitioners is um, using verbal instructions and repetitive practice, rehearsal, etc., um, is just a tool in a huge uh, box of methodological tools. Um, that's how it's conceptualised in um, uh, non-linear pedagogy. Uh, it, it's like sort of, um, uh, you, you know, you've got this wonderful range of um, uh, recipes for dealing with problems and helping an athlete, etc. And then you're only sticking with, um, you know, one or two meals that yeah. you eat every day. You know, there's a whole range of things that you can use. And for, I mean, this is a, an interesting point you raise there because I've heard this misconceptualization um, from people that um, uh, that, uh, you know, that, that non-linear pedagogy, etc. That, uh, uh, it, that you know, we don't know how to coach with it, and we, we don't know what to. I've, I've literally had coaches say to me, "Great ideas, but how do I coach?" Uh, for me. Uh, this should excite a coach. Of course, uh, yeah. For, for me to sort of, uh, a coach should say, "Well, look, I've been I've, I've been trained this way. Uh, there is a certain manual. I'm not going to rip it up and throw it away. We're not saying that, but uh, I'm going to be innovative. And what's more, I've got principles and theoretical concepts that can guide me in being innovative. So I'll try something, and that might not work. Well, why? Because." Oh yeah, this this concept didn't quite fit with that, or I've misunderstood that, etc. But I'm going to be innovative. I'm going to change. I'm going to adapt, um, and uh, I'm uh, and I look at each individual learner, each individual sports team that I work with, or a subgroup of athletes, and they've all got different needs. And how can I impact on them and help them to be the best that they can uh, using all, all you know all the, the range of methodologies that are available. Yeah, and, and it's about understanding, and this is something I wanted to, there's a couple of points I want to really um, explore with you, mm. which is, it's about understanding that the tool and the suitability of the tool for what it is you're trying to achieve, That's it. And, and also the potential negative consequences yes. of a tool versus another tool, Yes, because they've all got positive and negative That's right. impact. That's right. So... It's this point of intentionality. Mm. 
and being clear on intent and methodology linked to intent that I often, in the work I do with coaches, see a, see a lack of. Mm. I don't see the intentionality. Yes. I see an outcome, yeah, yeah, an yeah. intended outcome. Yes, yes, yes. But I don't necessarily see the methodology being the process, congruent with that. The process. This is what I'm trying to achieve. This is uh, in terms of the effects on the athlete. Yeah. This is what um, I'm assuming that the, the process that the athlete is going to go through. And, and I think it relates back to that question that you, you know, that you um, set for coaches um, I think it's a really important question um, any practitioner anyone involved in education um, learning is to constantly question themselves why am I using this approach why am I doing this and not something else and it may well be that the not something else might only be just it being close proximity to what you're trying to achieve it may not be completely in a different plane but you know, I think it's important to ask that because things may not be going the way that you want it to go, that you thought that um, that, it, it, that it needed to go, given the athlete's needs. And you know, it, it's not a question of uh, jumping in straight away and changing things, but looking at that, evaluating that, and deciding, can I do something slightly differently here? The, the point about constraints, um, manipulations that people forget. Uh, it's quite important to bear in mind. It's the Athlete task environment interaction that's important. It's the interaction between those three categories of constraints is important. It's not the athlete only, yeah. it's not the task only, it's not the environment. Uh, it's the interaction. And the point is, is that each athlete might interact uh, or react, if you like, differently with your approach. So you'll set it. Um, and, and coaches notice that, you know, when you read. Um, the insights, the experiential knowledge of good coaches, they will say that. They will say, I'll use the same method with another group of athletes, same level, and I'll get a very different reaction or a different response. So it's working out what are you trying to achieve with them, what are you trying to help them achieve, if you like, um, and what processes do you want them to undergo, and how can you um, facilitate that um, in, in the design of the practice task. I think with that... Um Keith, you touched on a really good idea about, as a coach, we have this opportunity to develop our own ecological niche, mm. where we have these players, and we can actually, the most exciting thing for me is every, like all these behaviours are new behaviours, mm. so you're always, you're making this niche or this ecological habitat or whatever in your coaching environment that is coming up with with behaviours all the time, and the players are coming up with new behaviours, mm. and emer like emerging from that. Mm that niche yeah, that, that you have yourself and it it means that you can't take something a curriculum or something that you have in one environment and move it to another yeah, environment yeah. because each niche each yes. ecological area is different absolutely right and I think this is that raises a very good issues because I think a lot of coaching and sports science support athlete support and development goes on with a model or template in mind you know, we mentioned that before yeah. about taking a model from another part of the world another culture another society and just transplanting it um, you know uh, into uh, another uh, approach where they got a different form of life it's really about understanding what each individual needs and how you can modify and adapt uh, what you're trying to achieve so I, I guess it goes back to it. The, the point. This is the, this is the key fundamental point about principles and methodologies and pedagogical practice is to see them as con constantly changing. They're dynamic. Of course. They're never the same. And so, what might be uh, an approach that you use with one group or one athlete can be slightly different, slightly evolved, or even quite different, quite evolved with um, another group or an athlete. And that's how you, we can understand instructions and repetitive practice. It's only a very, very tiny part of the process that might be needed by an athlete. Uh, so I would never say, never use them. Never, ever use them. I would never say that. What I would say is they're overused. They're a default mechanism. And even if you were going to use instructions in repetitive practice, they can be used in different ways. They can be used with a bit of a variety, variability involved. They can be used with, as you, I mean, I really like the example you gave, uh, Ben, from your practical example of um, uh, body language. Uh, rather than just verbal cues and um, words spoken to an athlete, uh, a signal, a sign, an emotion, a facial expression, etc., that conveys, that's the same. 
it's like a sort of a, almost like a guiding nudge in a certain direction. And I learned that um, that emotion probably, or showing emotion, and that's one thing that I think is in certain contexts we've lost a lot of emotion when you go to youth sport and even in PE, even in PE class, like we're losing this emotional connection which we had when we played backyard games, we we had when we played sport and I got it back when I was in when when I was in Africa because like I watched these guys, they score a goal and they dance Mm. and they they party and they slide and they they don't care. They don't care what's around and they they celebrate everything. And it it like it's invigorating you're just there you're like yeah, yeah, yeah. and also I couldn't some of the players I couldn't communicate verbally with yeah, yeah, yeah. so I have to be able to communicate with yeah, them yeah good good so I always what a challenge for you as a coach yeah Fantastic. I always had this idea like I've always had this idea one and this maybe someone in the world might do this mm-hmm. it's um, if you took a team and you didn't talk for a whole season yeah, yeah, and you yeah. coached them yeah but you didn't. You weren't allowed to talk. But you could do everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd be fascinated, and I, I got a little bit of a glimpse into this. But yeah. I'd be fascinated to see what would yeah. what would happen. Yeah, that would be interesting. What, what a book that yeah. would be. So yeah. <laughs> someone should do it. I like yeah, if yeah, I get yeah. time. Maybe in a couple yeah. of years I'll do that. Wow. Maybe I'll go to another um, Uganda. Eng- okay. Everyone speaks I went, English. In I Uganda. wrote about this on the blog. Okay. Uh, an, an interesting experience that wasn't necessarily entirely positive, but um, when I had my, I got a job working as a talent development coach for England hockey working mm. with some of the like elite players mm. eight, under 18 under 16 players mm. so we had this academy that was about was quite a lot of players boys and girls it's the first time they've mixed them together so the dynamics of that were quite challenging yeah, yeah. they come from a range of different backgrounds some come from independent schools some from state so they all have different and um, the whole premise of the academy which was great was we're not selecting players okay. we're just helping them learn and develop okay. it's about creativity mm. it's about so so we had lots of freedom, which was brilliant. Mm. And we gave them, we were able to, we were able to give or, or, or provide for them lots of scope. Mm. What was really interesting was how difficult they found it to adapt to that because mm. they were so used to being compliant That's right. to a particular That's coach's norm. Right. Yeah, yeah. But the interesting thing was is that I had a coach developer come to work with me on the very first session. Mm. I've talked about this quite a bit. And he challenged me afterwards. Uh, he observed the session, then he afterwards he sent me an email and he basically challenged me with seven questions um, and you can tell that they were all like like spikes through the heart. Because <laughs> yeah. my first session, I, my, my style was all very, you know, it's very much about kind of a positive environment. So there was a lot of, a lot of you know, kind of high fives and big, big, lang- big noise yeah. and language and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Trying to create this positive environment, also trying to make an impression, you know. Mm-hmm. It was the first time I'd worked at this level and quite excited about it. Um, doing quite a lot of hot reviews and all those sorts of different things. And afterwards, the feedback I got was, you know, like, basically consider the value of that. Mm-hmm. And I was a bit like... Huh? <laughs> and I went through a real horrible period of kind of like, you know, the full grief curve of rejection and <laughs> anger and, you know, and all that sort of stuff, you know, and, and I just I back and forward. And, and actually went through quite a significant period of really doubting mm. my capabilities and skills. Mm-hmm. But it really taught me something really valuable because what it then made me do is, right, I'm going to shut up. Mm. I'm not going to say anything. Mm. And the thing I wrote about was I thought it, the constraint of not using verbal Mm -hmm. and only so then firstly practice design becomes far more about about getting that on point yes second thing is I become far more attuned to things that players are saying Okay, or, or the sounds they're making. Listening. Yeah, yeah so yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. I can, I'm can. i picking up this fatigue now. Yeah, yeah, I'm picking yeah. up this frustration. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, I become a bit more attuned um, to actually almost like just sort of feeling emotion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I described it as having like superpowers. And I wrote this oh, blog yeah, post yeah, about, yeah. you know, yeah, like I became like before. daredevil yeah. and, you know, <laughs> and all these different heightened senses. Mm. But it was, what was interesting was taking away my basically torrent of verbal information that mm. I thought was creating this positive environment mm. and leaving the space yeah. for that to happen, that happen yeah. then allowed me to start to pick up on some also which then also helped me to adapt because yes. then I could pick up on ah right this isn't this isn't where it needs to be so now we can tweak it mm. and we can tweak it in this way and let's now observe to see whether we're now beginning to see the players react in the way that we would hope they might react yeah, or whatever yeah. it might be so 
I went through that sort of experience <laughs> in a kind of in a sort of over about say three months, okay. um, whilst also going through a process of um, completely thinking that I was garbage at this whole thing and I should just give up. Right. <laughs> but it was a quite a valuable experience. I wouldn't necessarily give it to somebody else, no, because <laughs> it was quite traumatic. Yeah. Um, but it was interesting. Yeah, and I, and I think it's useful to um, yeah, you know, not necessarily go through that sort of crash and burn type yeah, of yeah. doubt. And say, you know, but, but on the other hand. Uh, just to have uh, questions raised, yeah, and then consider them in a kind of a you know in, in, in a sort of relatively unemotional way, if you can, to um, un- understand you know well, what does it mean, what, what can I do, um, and then to try these things, yeah. and then to be really open-minded about um, well, would this work or not, and how can I work, and, and maybe if I did this, you know, yeah. and you can quickly engage with that as well, you yeah. know, so it wouldn't be a case of just throwing it all out and then having to start again, but. Um, working on, um, and I think that would be quite exciting. New ways yeah. of um, communication, isn't it? Really, yeah. uh, of communication and um, uh, you know, working with an athlete, uh, where they're the ones that are really doing the work, and all you're doing is just nudging, pushing, guiding, mentoring, um, and very, very infrequently stopping and giving a verbal instruction. You know, so we're not throwing it. What we're not saying is throw it right out. Never ever use it. Remember that. Uh, which is, uh, I'm, I'm saying that because it is a misconception that I've read. Yeah. Um, but it's really just a, a, a limited part of the whole rich range of exciting tools that you could use. And that's an important point to make, and something that I thought was really that I took away from the conference in Ireland mm. um, was when you know you, you sort of presented almost like a spectrum yes and there's an assumption i think that people feel that like a non-linear approach or constraints led approach if you like is at an extreme end of a continuum yeah. where it's like just leave them to it yes just let them play yeah, yeah. and it's not there no it's back from there yes. because actually there's more to it than that it's yes. about quite skillful manipulation of, of task yeah. environment and the and, and based on the requirements of the athlete yeah, yeah. that is, is helping them to experience something else. That's right. That's exactly It's not right. just leaving them to it. No, 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 no. I mean, it, because it, this, if you left them to it, the system could go all over. <laughs> yeah. It could go anywhere. You know, it's like sort of leaving a, um, a, a, a robot, um, uh, you know, a vacuum cleaner. It can go off all, all over the place, etc. And you might have one part of the room that might be uh, dirty, dusty still, and another part's super clean, you know. Um, it's really about nudging and guiding the learner towards where um, they could be uh, based on their needs and your understanding of their needs that, and that's why it's important to co-design with them yeah. because they've got to be engaged in that. Um, one of the best ways to, um, I think, understand that continuum, so you talk about one end of the continuum, got highly structured, classical, traditional approaches of instruction and repetition and rehearsal and at the other end it's very open discovery learning exploratory behavior um, one of the good ways of understanding um, where on that continuum an athlete needs to be um, is to consider the um, what I call the process of self-regulation it, it, ultimately as a coach your aim should be to help the athlete to become self-regulating in performance in other words that psychologically emotionally socially with other with with opponents with with um the teammates etc physically of course they've got to as i said before interact with the environment and their interaction involves them regulating their behaviors um and sometimes uh that self-regulation uh needs to be quite restrained and very narrow uh when your opponents allow you to or the condition in the team sport allows you to uh, but a lot of the time it varies it's very rare that the self-regulation is completely open-ended that you really literally do not have a clue what what you're going to do next very very rarely especially in team sports yes because you want to be able to share the intentionality you want to be able to share what you if you go off if you go off and do a random behavior you know with your teammates and they're um, standing there looking at you and going what, you what is this person doing? Where, where are they going? Then that self-regulation that is so open-ended. Of course, but in, but it's really about moving up and down the um, you know the the, the the sort of spectrum where you have self-regulation that's quite um, uh, very narrow. 
but also where you need to be engaged with what's going on, as you say, attuned to what's happening in the environment and um, emotionally um, uh, self-regulating as well. But athletes need experience of all those, all those contexts, uh, and that's what learning design is about. Really, designing a particular learning context, uh, learning task. So, w- with an approach in the mind, in mind. So, it might be that, for example, you. You look at it, and together with an athlete, you work out that they need a bit more experience of working under pressure, working when they're feeling a bit anxious, etc., in a certain situation. How do you design um, a task that helps the athlete to learn to self-regulate, to regulate their anxiety, to focus on what their performance demands are, rather than how I'm feeling right now? Yeah. yeah. You, you, you used a term there that I think is a really important one. I've heard you talk about this, and I know you've written about this as well which is this idea of attunement mm. and almost a reconceptualization of... You almost have gone, right, I don't like the word skill acquisition. Mm. I know it's a term of art that mm. people understand, but mm. term of skill attunement. Mm. And the idea there that the athlete, what they're doing is instead of them just being able to perform movements mm. um, and learning to perform movements, not to say that's not important, mm. but instead of just learning to perform movements and then the assumption being that they know the context in which that movement might be needed, yes. what we're saying is is that they're learning to, or well, they're becoming more attuned to the various opportunities or information sources mm. that are out there within a game-like context yes. that might require these particular movements or movements like them. Yes, yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. Do you want to unpack this skill attunement yeah, idea? Yeah, attunement I mean, is, a, is a concept from ecological psychology. James Gibson, James Gibson talked about attunement um, and uh, the important point that he made was that um, uh, that, that people in life, in life use uh, a variety of information sources to regulate their their actions. And so, um, if you're just dependent on vision, uh, what happens when vision's impaired? So you you know you, you're um, very visual oriented. You're driving a car, say, uh, then fog comes along, or um, you know it's night night time. It's pretty dark. There's no lights, etc. You have to adapt to. Um, different information sources that are available, you know, the sound of other cars around, wind your windows down, etc. Uh, the speed's adapted, the, w- the, the way that you control the car is adapted, etc. because the road is windy rather than straight and that sort of thing. So there's essentially there's rich sources of information out there that people are pretty good at from an ecological perspective. They will become gradually become attuned to the sources of information that they need that surround them. Um, in order to achieve the same uh, outcome. If you put an athlete in a very highly structured practice situation where they only rely on one source of information or two sources of information, and yet when they go to the dynamic, messy, noisy, competitive environment, there's a rich range of source of information they could use. You're, if you like, you're underpowering them. You're not empowering them. You're limiting them. Yeah, you're <laughs> limiting them you know, by your practice, you know. Uh, and it might be that they spend some time in the, you know, the, the sort of narrow range of information um, uh, designs in practice, but they need to move towards that sort of more messy, noisy, real world of what competitive performance is, is like. Even if, even in sta- stable task um, environments, such as, for example, archery, springboard diving. Um, I'm not talking about the, just team games only. I'm talking about a rich range of information sources you can become attuned to um, in all sorts of tasks. Um, and it's quite interesting because I'd go back to Dominic Orth uh, when he was doing his PhD. Uh, it was on climbing uh, with his supervisor Ludovic Sefer. Ludovic uh, is an ice climber and he's, he's talked about... Um, ice climbers, so those who don't know about ice climbing, they use crampons mm. to kick their legs into they, they, they climb frozen waterfalls mm. I don't know why they do it, but they <laughs> climb frozen waterfalls you why wouldn't you? Yeah, you <laughs> no, 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 I haven't done that yet no, not yet uh, they use ice hooks and they use crampons to climb these frozen waterfalls and of course the temperature varies and so lack of opportunities for action in Brisbane yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that, yeah. Well, you, that's exactly it, yeah, the affordances for frozen waterfalls in Brisbane, yeah um, but um, the, you know, and of course uh, things change. So uh, the, the the best climbers are attuned to the yeah. existing holes already in the uh, in the ice structure of the, of the frozen waterfall because that saves energy. So they'll look and they'll go, okay, that's an existing hole. The novices they just 
they're so worried about falling <laughs> off as I would be. They just they will just hit the same. Um, they use all their energy yeah. hitting the ice to, to make a hole that they're happy with. Um, experts apparently can tell the difference between blue ice, slightly blue tinge, and white ice because that gives you differences in uh, support. Like melting. Yeah, that's right. Melting and, and support structure. So the affordance of um, so they're, they're attuned to different information sources. Um, experts, I'm talking about ice climbers compared to novices. And go back to your point about intentionality as well. The novices have very different intentions to the experts. The experts want to climb safely, of course, but they also want to get up to the top of this. Uh, I mean, some of these frozen waterfalls are 400 meters yeah. long, yeah. so this is not just a walk in the park. You know, yeah. uh, they want to get up to the top of um, the ice wa- frozen waterfall as quickly as possible before temperature changes, before um, it gets too dark or, or whatever novices they just do not want to fall off yeah. and so they're all the their intentionality is about not falling off and um, so in a sense that because they're not attuned to the information the rich information sources that um, even the sound yeah. of the ice tool on the uh, frozen waterfall that tells climbers about the quality the properties of that ice yeah. getting up Quickly, you see. So that's it. I think that you know that that research was published was a, a great example of skill attunement or skill adaptation, as we sometimes. And that's with that's um, adaptation or attunement to something that's essentially um, it doesn't it doesn't like try and take a ball off you. Yes. Yes. You know. Yes. But there's still information sources coming from something that most of us who are novices would view as being. Static. Yes, that's right. Yeah. It's, it's dynamic in the sense of it is changing maybe at the, at the, as uh, temperature gradients change or as um, uh, if ambient vision changes yeah. From, yeah. from day to, to night climbing, etc. And some, of the, some people do um, climb frozen waterfalls at night with a, with a light on, you know, again, why <laughs> I don't know. But, but some people do it. You know. <laughs> I've um, experienced something a little bit similar, but not to that extent. <laughs> Have you? Yeah, when we were in Nepal, we were... We, um, we got to the top and we had to go across. We we're on the Annapurna circuit and we had to go across the pass. Yeah. And um, it started snowing. We woke up at four o'clock in the morning. It was like a blizzard. Oh, wow. And I'll never forget it. We had no idea. Mm. I was with my mate. We didn't take a guide with us, but there was guides there with other people. Mm. One of the guides said, "No, we're not going." The other guide, this Nepalese guy, goes outside, shines his torch in the in the sky, looks at the snow for like mm. ten seconds, goes, "We're going now." Okay. And just leaves. Wow. And we're in the, and we, he put us at the front because we were the people without a guide and we didn't have someone help. Like they're like, okay, you can protect. Yeah, so if you people. guys fall, exactly, it's not so on no him. problem. So <laughs> we're at the front of this line, looking for reflective red things that they've put through in case of this situation. Oh, okay. The whole way up, oh, wow. this oh, wow. yeah. insane. It was, yeah. but I can't imagine climbing more ice <laughs> waterfall yeah, yeah. with a light. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, but I think that shows exactly, you know, that, that the people uh, not only will challenge themselves um, in these extreme sports environments, for example, but they're, they're, they've got the skills, the knowledge, the know-how to uh, safely undertake those challenges. Yeah. They're not safe environments, but they can, they can be negotiated. I mean, um, a good colleague of mine, Eric Breimer, uh, he looks at... Uh, ecological dynamics in an extreme sports context and he says there's a misconception with extreme sports athletes that they are wild risk takers he said it's the complete opposite they are so skilled and knowledgeable that they will um, like your guide you know he's, he's, he's so attuned to the information from uh, the properties of the snowflakes and the rate of falling and also his knowledge about the weather systems in that uh, part of the world, that he can make a, a quick decision about, yeah, this is going to get worse, and if we go now, we can get through. Because just looking at the snowflakes, it's not going to settle so much, and it's not coming down, so we'll be deep in snow, so we can't yeah. climb, you know. Um, and that's a great example of attunement. And th- this is the point, is that in life, uh, people can become really quite highly attuned to their environments, as long as coaches, teachers, educators help them, allow them to express themselves and allow them to search and explore and, and support them in that um, journey. And that's, I think that's the, the great thing about the ecological approach is that, that in a nutshell, it's about attuned, like becoming attuned to this environment and it's 
changing all the time and it's if you if you change your mindset and you leave what you might have been thinking about before and you come into this ecological approach Mm -hmm. you actually your eyes broaden you see more things you become more attuned to what opportunities someone else might have so as a coach Mm -hmm. I'm not just being attuned for myself yeah 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 I'm actually trying to share the affordance with someone else or share the intentionality with one of my players yeah 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 because Now I need to understand his personality. Okay, yeah. what kind of player is this player? Or what kind of person is this person? And then share that with, with and that, and That's a fantastic example. It's a, it's a, and it really requires a nuanced relationship. I'll give you a practical example of this um, of attunement and how I misinterpreted it one time. So I was watching a competition, Olympic Games, and there was um, a long jumper, a female long jumper, uh, waiting to take off. And the camera spotted her interaction with her coach um, in her uh, in, in, in the audience and the thing about intu- attunement is that the athlete needs to be this is why the athlete needs to become highly attuned because typically coaches are not allowed to get involved in, in lots of different sports yeah. you know uh, recently there was the, the issue in tennis was it Venus Williams or someone that got um, uh, that was accused of um, there was a, of, of the coach being involved yeah and got you know they they were sort of um, denigrated because of that in the media, um, so so there are strict regulations about how much the, the coach can be involved. So it makes sense for the athlete to be the one who's got the skills, knowledge, and attunement because they're the ones in uh, competition solving problems. So there was a long jumper, and there was a headwind, and um, the long jumper was waiting to go, but she kept looking to the stand, and the camera picked this up, and the coach was going giving hand signals and then triggering the start of the jump and, and I felt oh that's just so controlling that's so really um, the athletes um, not attuned uh, but the coaches are attuned and the coach is dictating but it turned out that actually the, 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 that wasn't the approach at all it was just that in the competitive environment the um, athlete couldn't wear, from where she started she couldn't feel the wind uh, direction and extent of the wind to, uh, for waiting for the wind to drop from where she was right. but the coach could from from his position and so the coach was supporting the athlete by giving the hand signals because the athlete um, couldn't use the attunement that she had so it was that sense it yes. was like an extra it, it's like the sixth sense <laughs> it was and, and that is how coaches could help where they could help athletes um, in certain situations where they haven't got it yet or they're in a situation where they haven't got the attunement um, that would be the reason why but really it typically should be the, the athlete one who's developing that um, really high um, level of um, skill and, and that's one of the problems I have um, with quite a lot of what you might call traditional approaches mm. where I think often we're too quick to rob the athlete of the opportunity to become attuned because if you are given solutions continuously let's call them te- let's call technical solutions mm. and then all you do is go around and try and deliver these solutions you never become attuned to the moment in which that solution might be required that's right that's a good point and you never get attuned to the idea of coming up with your own solution to that particular problem yeah, yeah, that yeah. might be better that's right. than the one I've got that's right. as your coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, this is a challenge I have quite a bit to so coaches is with all, well, if you haven't got the techniques, you haven't got the, the, the skills, they use the word skills, which is often meaning technique, mm. then you can't play the game. Mm. And I, I often say, really? Yeah. <laughs> well, Let's have a go, shall we? Have you ever tried that? Have you ever actually taken a group of individuals who don't have any concept and asked them to play a game and see what they do? Because it's quite interesting and really quite fascinating to see the solutions that they come up with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, in everyday life, we find ourselves in situations where um, we may not have certain expertise. You know, so, for for example, um, if we... um, if we if we want to uh, take you know we're in the UK now it's cold um, radiators are on central heating and sometimes in a uh, pocket there blocks a radiator and um, you need you need to bleed the radiator which is get rid of the pocket of air by applying a, a small um, tool to it etc. I'm not a qualified technical engineer I never do that 
but this is what you do. You, you know, your one alternative is to call out an expert will charge you a ninety pounds or whatever it is fee to come and do that for you. Uh, it'll be cold. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's right. And and, and secondly, uh, you can learn it yourself. You can try it, and you know there are now uh, support sources on YouTube um, <laughs> that can give you you know support you etc. <laughs> but um, you know you you can you can learn these things and you can adapt, and, and you're not going to be perfect straight away etc. But, but this is the point. In 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 real life, we are used to this idea that well, I'll have a go at it. I'll, I'll if I don't have a go, I won't learn it. And yet, from a sports perspective. Um, it, it, you're right. There's some. There's a view of coaching which is pretty much about no, no. We we, we can't let the athletes um, to their own devices because oh, it'll be mayhem and they just can't possibly play the game. Mm. But as you say, I think that's a really good way. To play. Well, well, let's try it. Let's see. Um, you know uh, what happens. And the problem for me, linked to the attunement piece, is they don't. Um it never gives the opportunity for the athlete to become attuned to the idea of um, the, the various information sources that might guide their action. Mm. And so this idea of perception and action yeah. coupling. Yeah. Um, if you're mostly focused on action, yeah, yeah. and I experienced this recently with a group of coaches I was working with, yeah. who I was placing um, the constraint on the, the, the defender Mm. in order to bring about an adaptation in the ball carrier mm. Mm. Um, and the reason for that was I wanted the ball carrier to become attuned to what the defender was doing and how they might act to that mm. Mm. and what a couple of the coaches said to me afterwards was well, I've never thought of that I always thought it was about getting the ball carrier to be able to move with the ball yeah. in certain ways yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but surely that needs to be dictated by what the opponent might do yeah, the affordance of the opponent the opportunities that your opponents have given you etc you know so I think that that's a really good example because um, becoming attuned to what your opponent is doing in team sports, for example, let's focus on that, it's a major skill, it's a major um, uh, aspect of performance that athletes need to develop themselves because if there's, uh, in this day and age of performance analysis where your every move is plotted, um, you've got to be able to adapt because you know they will have sussed you out beforehand they'll know what your your preferred moves are what you like to do uh, and so you've got to be able to adapt to them so what uh, what are you what are your opponents affording you what are they what opportunities are they giving you are they pushing up high is the space behind them yeah. is the space in front of them yeah. etc and, and not only that um, it, it changes during uh, performance as well, during a game itself. So it'll be suddenly they're pushing up high, suddenly they're dropping back, etc. And to be so sensitively attuned to those changes, those are the top teams. To exploit it. Yeah, to, to exploit it. Rather than sort of wait for the coach to say, it, because they can't give timeouts, or they can, unofficially they can't, you know, play can go down injured and you can get constraint, uh, convey instructions, etc. But it's far more empowering for the athletes to play what they see as Dan Carter uh, mentioned at the beginning but the alternative is that often I think what a lot of coaches are looking to do is they have a game plan um, which is essentially a way of getting coherence amongst a group yeah. and, the, the, and the assumption is if we have perfect adherence to the game plan we'll be successful <laughs> and it's lack of adherence to the game plan that causes that causes us to be unsuccessful yes, yes. and so every time there's a loss we didn't stick to the game plan yeah, yeah, yeah. now often for me that's partly so the, the part of the issue there is that either the game plan was wrong or the opponent did something that negated the game plan. <laughs> um, probably a combination of both. But if you're never actually understanding what the opponent might do that might negate your game plan, then you, you're not adaptable. Yes. You're not creative. You're not a problem solver. That's right. All you are is an adherent yes. to a pre-prescribed set compliant. of activities. You're just compliant. An athlete is uh, it, it, the, the, the best athletes are the most compliant. Uh, and, and of course, that's not what happens in, in life. You, you know, you, there's loads of examples of athletes who are considered maverick uh, or subversive, etc. And, and the reason why they, they, they're, they're like that and they're good at what they're doing is because um, if there's one thing that you can guarantee in a team sport, good, good quality level of team sport performance, is that your opponents will have uh, analysed your game plans. Yeah. Uh, let's be, let's be, um, you know, let's say that there are more than one game plans. And they will know even when you switch. You know, oh, after this, they'll go to that. Yeah. They'll go to that, etc. Yeah. So trying something different um, is really, really important. Um, and, and 
there's some I mean the, the best sports teams in the world are great at disrupting your game plan and if you haven't got a plan B or a plan C then you're in deep trouble in modern <laughs> sport so it goes back to what we were talking about before about this sort of resistance to change etc things are changing technology is changing your every move as an athlete uh, and a sports team is now plotted and tracked and stored in a database and not only that people know when you will switch uh, even even unintended stuff that you don't realise yeah, yeah. That you're giving away subconsciously it's now being plotted that's my big mission as a team sport coach is to get a team that are so attuned to the opponent <laughs> or the opponent's actions mm. that their game plan is dictated by that wow what are they doing yes right and we'll just explore that for a bit right they're doing that okay yeah. this is the way we're going to operate right. here oh they've changed yeah, yeah, right yeah. how else can we do and, but that's a suggestion that it's happening in that time frame yes. but that would happen maybe a minute to minute yeah. but also literally millisecond to millisecond yeah. Yeah, in yeah. those micro moments yeah, yeah. Aha. Yeah. and then you're undefendable yes because you haven't got a game plan yes all you're doing is making sure that you do something that's different yeah, yeah, than, yeah. based on the picture you see yeah, fantastic I mean what, what a wonderful uh, task goal I think what a goal what, a, what an intention it's going to be my life's work I feel <laughs> yeah. I mean that's the thing I mean, let's, let, let, let's get this right you know, it's, it's it a is, good life's work <laughs> it is it is and very challenging but you know really that would be the ultimate and that is the ultimate in putting the athlete at the centre of the learning process the development process the performance process isn't it really about looking for opportunities and exploit those affordances as quickly as you can in that environment. I mean, that would, be, as you say, that would be unplayable. I've done the game planning stuff for a long, long time, and it's joyless because mm. the, the athlete's just a means to an end. Right? Yeah. You know, like, um, a, like a game of chess. Yeah, you're moving. Yeah, the absolutely pieces are being moved. And you know, it works. Yeah. And this is the what this is the thing about all this is everything works, yes. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, but it works to a point. Mm. Um, in the sense that you do get you know coordination, you do get organisation, you do get sort of a shared idea, a shared mm. mental model, if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we can address that. And usually, because most other teams haven't got that, that's it. You are successful. Yes. That's until it. they do something that counteracts it, that disrupts it, and then yeah. you and then you find yourself as a coach completely going yeah, berserk yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's not. Happening as you yeah. wanted to do and they can't adapt yeah, yeah, so right. this is where you know painful experience has taught me this yeah, yeah, yeah. now I'm conscious that we're coming up on time and you've got somebody else to speak to um, after us but there's one thing I do want to just, just dwell on a little bit if we can this idea of over constraining and under constraining oh, yeah, that I've yeah. heard you talk about in the yeah. past because I think this is a really important point for people to grasp people who are working in this space yes. exploring trying new things out and I know there are a lot of people out there who are kind of almost a bit just let them play yeah 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 and yeah. they're almost under constraining in yeah. that case yeah, and then yeah. sometimes we're over constraining and the difference between the two yeah yeah and I think this this kind of um, if you like goes back uh, full circle to our conversation at the beginning of the podcast um, where we're talking about the need for a good conceptualisation a good understanding of ecological dynamics and principles and non-linear pedagogy and on the face of it using constraints people might go yeah yeah I think I understand what that means you just manipulate something you change something uh, and then uh, people adapt to it athletes adapt to it but it's there's a real skill to it and this this is um, it's not a magic bullet or a golden ticket as I've heard uh, people talk about which I completely agree with um, it's it's a real uh, it's a tool a methodology and approach which you have to use with real skill and knowledge as a coach okay. uh, because you could you could um, over constrain for that particular athlete or group of athletes at that time and that means that by over constraining I mean that you use a very narrow range of task constraints that inhibits your athletes from exploring and discovering uh, other possibilities for action even as they emerge. Um, instead, they've got strict instructions that said this is this is what you should um, do. Two touch. Yeah, for example, yeah. is a good example of it. You know, when when they may have space to use three touches or even one touch, they just want to use one touch. I can hit this straight away, but I've got to use two touches. Why? Or nine because touches. I'll be I'll be or yeah or leave Zero the ball. Touch. Yeah, you know, it might be like that. Uh, and then if you get penalised for it, then you know, that, uh, by the by the coach that would be wrong. Uh, <laughs> equally, you could under constrain. Which is where you know you get the sort of cliches that come in about let the game be the teacher, mm. etc. Well, yeah, the game can teach you a certain amount, but this is where, this is where the skill of the coach comes in. Is where the game uh, or the game that you constrain and design 
will help an athlete learn. I prefer to use that terminology rather than teach an athlete. I help an athlete learn certain things that that athlete might need to learn at that moment in time and not other things. Because let's face it, there's a whole host of things, yeah. skills and um, qualities and properties that they can they, that you can work on together. And so that's the skill of it, that moving around and manipulating constraints based on the needs of, of those athletes <coughs> that athlete at that particular point in time that's the skill of coaching and learning design as I call it um, so I think that's a really good point I have talked about it before because I have come across some examples of uh, uh, where coaches may be over constraining under constraining a simple example in um, uh, like a team game setting is when you um, set a practice constraint task constraint for attackers and defenders you're immediately giving information for example, to either group about how to behave relative to the other. You're not allowing one group to work out yeah. what the other group are uh, allowing them, uh, you know, what opportunities they're providing them with at the time. So why not give different instructions to attackers and defenders secretly? Yeah. Don't let them know. So they then work, they become better at working out what the defence are doing or what the attackers are doing. Yeah. You know, so if the attackers, if you're saying, um, rather than saying two touch. I want you to move the ball as quickly as possible. Yeah. Two touch if possible, but you know, look, as quickly as you possibly can. But don't tell the defenders that. So the defender doesn't know where to stand. Where, you know, when I'm marking somebody, if I know they they got two touches. I know where to stand. Yeah. I don't want to get too tight. I'll just back off a bit because they'll control and they have to play. I know what their next decision is. It's yeah. easy to defend. It is. Yeah, a lot <laughs> easier than in a game situation where you don't know what they're going to do where they're going to take like Lionel Messi for example multiple touches that's what makes him such a top class footballer because he takes multiple touches when he needs to um, some players can't take those multiple touches uh, and defenders will then um, by taking multiple touches he creates so many affordances He's, is he going to shoot is he going to pass is he going to dribble you don't know it changes the game it can, it can change the game Yeah. other times he'll just play a one touch and his skill though is being able to take multiple touches without losing the information sources that might guide the action he might take. Yes. That's yes. his skill. Yes. Is a defender comes and he can move the ball wherever he needs to move the ball yep. because he's attuned to what they're doing and his, his micro manipulations are based on that. That's right. As opposed to moving the ball for moving the ball's sake. Safe. Yeah, <laughs> this exactly is my right. Thesis. <laughs> yeah. 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 And of course, defenders themselves, uh, they adapt the way they behave relative to the fact that they know he can take multiple touches. He's yeah. capable of doing that. Yeah. So they will position themselves accordingly. Yeah. Whereas if they know that somebody always plays one touch, well, you know what to do. Get as tight as you can, so they can't take that one touch. That's all. That's all you need to do. Uh, but someone who can do multiple touches, they can play quickly. They can play one touch. Suddenly, the affordances are much more diverse than um, than someone who's limited in uh, in the approach to the ball. So it goes back to that. Just to summarise that point, you know, there's a real, real nuanced thinking about constraints how to use constraints that that's the skill of it that's the skill of it, uh, a major skill of it. And, and so again come back to attunement I think yes. from a coach's perspective attunement to when you might have over constrained or under constrained mm. is part of your skill yes. as a coach Absolutely. so for me it changes the way we plan yeah. it changes the way we, we act in the moment with those so the idea that we've got a perfect design of a game and we're going to play that game and We'll, that's what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to get rid of that, yes. right? Or whatever the game is, or the, the act activity, or the task. Yeah. It, all I can't ever remember a time when I haven't had to amend it slightly. That's it. Because that's it. I've become, I'm attuned to. Ah, right. Just need to tweak that a little yes. bit because I haven't quite got that right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's usually there's something else to do with the defenders or the attackers or whatever yeah. it might be. Yeah, yeah. And but you have to be attuned to that. Yes. It's it's not standing on the sideline with your arms folded yeah. look there's learning happening over yes, there yes that's right it, it, you, know, you have to live it, it, it you, have to, you have to be, be in it observing yeah. listening hearing and that's why this is co-design going on because you're interacting with the players um, because a different group of players will um, act differently according to that design so if the design framework for the task is quite loose generally and it often in the case of just having intentions uh, in terms of certain space or distances etc um, then that's kind of loose and then the players as they interact with those task constraints 
they'll be shaping what you could be doing next. And that doesn't mean that you just twiddle and interfere and uh, just for the sake of it. But it, and, and, and this is the skill of it, where you're deeply engrossed with it. Because I've, I've heard some people misconceive uh, application of constraints by saying you, you apply the constraints and then you may as well just sit back and read the newspaper, have a cup of tea, because then it all kind of like um, the game is the teacher. That's not true at all, because really the skillful coaches will be interacting with the way that the players are um, interacting with the design of that task. So, for example, if the players are getting right familiar with it and they're comfortable, they're in a comfort zone, okay, I'm going to change, I'm going to, I'm going to tweak something that pushes them out of their comfort zone because you bet your life, come performance in a competitive environment, the opponents will be doing that, good opponents will be doing that straight away. So you're only, if you like, forcing them to co-adapt. You're acting like a good opponent would um, in a competitive setting. So yeah, it's evolving and dynamic in that way. One that's, of my, that's what I mean about new models of coaching. Yeah, one of my favourite things to do is is to, as the coach, be the referee in the game. Okay. Because then you're in the middle. Yeah, yeah. And you're living it with them, yeah. and you can you can be changing things on the run. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And just nudging. You know, body language. Because you're moving with, yeah. you're around where everything's happening. Yeah. You're in the middle. The players yeah. get used to having a referee in yeah. there, but then also. You can manipulate things yeah. very quickly. I've heard people. Have, I've heard people observe that uh, Pep Guardiola coaches, Running. Yeah, yeah. coaches like that. He's right in the flow, the that dynamic line. flow. Because um, you feel you feel it. Yeah. Then you're more like emotionally connected. A lot of when I started coaching, I'd stand there, but. Um, more and more I'm running around I'm moving I'm in there with them just a little like not instructing them no, not telling here no. but it's like yeah, just, just a, a little push yeah, or yeah. a little a little look over the over your shoulder and yeah, a point yeah, yeah. to someone yeah. and then they go oh I need to be here yeah. or a clap or and then you're like in the middle of it yeah. and it's I think Fantastic. it's uh, yeah. new, new models of coaching definitely yeah. you know, that, that's what's needed um, to make the most of this powerful theoretical framework Brilliant. Good. Keith, I really appreciate your time. Um, and I know you've got somebody else to go to talk to, and also you're, you're off um, on a tour of the world. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I do appreciate your time, and uh, thank you for allowing us into your office. <laughs> a, bit, a bit noisy, isn't it, really? Yeah, like, I have to do something about the noise. But um, no, no, it's great. Uh, I mean, it, the best of these podcasts are really where they're conversations an exchange of ideas and a discussion a sharing experiences and, and this was um, you know, really covered that quite well so yeah thank you thank you thanks for listening to the talent equation podcast if you like the show then please consider supporting it by leaving a review on your favorite podcast player telling your friends about it or even becoming a hero and show your appreciation by becoming a patron just head over to the talentequation.co.uk and click on the becoming a patron button at the top of the page so there you have it wow that was an hour and 50 minutes that flew by um we were just really getting into it talking about all sorts of things and then sadly uh, Keith had to head off to another meeting so um so Ben and I had to head off to the road to go and uh, and uh, chat with some some other people and uh, and do some of the bits and pieces we we're heading off to the future of coaching conference actually so uh, that was uh, that was a good time and we were able to relay some of the conversations that we'd actually had with Keith and uh, it stimulated some really interesting conversations for Ben and I in terms of um the you know the drive over there so um i hope you enjoyed that there's a lot in there and we could have got into a lot more detail if we uh, we were if we if we had if we had more time and um it's hopeful that um, keith's now becoming a bit of a dab hand of these uh, these podcasts so it may well be that i can uh, pin him down uh, another time and we can uh, we can get in if you've got questions that this has stimulated then uh, by all means um, send them through uh, because I'll be able to put them to Keith in the future um, or at the very least uh, potentially sort of answer some of them myself uh, on, on one of my Ask Me Anything episodes and also if you're interested in finding out more of this more about this kind of stuff then uh, there are a few spots available on the Conclave head over to the podcast and uh, and click on the become a patron link and you'll see the option to join the Conclave um, I'm just setting the dates of when we'll be meeting uh, at the moment, so now's a good time to join. Uh, in the meantime, I hope you have a great time with your coaching this week. And remember, ditch those drills. <laughs>